my family has always said, we knew you were going to become an actress. Um, and I, I, I had no clue until I was about 11 and I had just moved to school and it was in year six and they were doing a production of Aladdin. And I remember that the whole cast was already placed. There were lots of costumes and lots of rehearsals going on. And I would peer in to see them rehearsing, sort of looking on longingly, thinking, why wasn't I here three months ago? Because then I would be in the production. And I was hanging by that door for so long that I remember the drama teacher saying, would you like to be in it? I said, yes, I'll do anything. And they did indeed find anything for me to do. I was the snake charmer, which had nothing to do with the story. I was standing by a tree doing a wiggly dance as the snake charmer in Aladdin. <laughs> and I remember us doing the production in school. And then suddenly it, you know, it caught wind and we ended up doing it at the Theatre Royal. Yes, the Theatre Royal in Stratford. Oh, Stratford wow. Theatre Royal. Oh, yeah, Stratford East. Yes, yeah, yeah. Stratford East now. Yeah. Um, and yes, I was on stage and I thought, this is fantastic. Oh gosh, I've, I've died and gone to heaven. And I absolutely loved it, and that was the start of that. My name is John Perkis, and this is Diary of an Act. Well, here we are, back on the chess terrace in Central Park. As promised, I'm thrilled to be able to bring back Yvonne Wondera. Yvonne and I had the great pleasure, at least I had the great pleasure, I should say, of acting opposite Yvonne in Splendid Isolation, which was an adaptation of a Joseph Conrad piece directed by Simon Usher. And I have to say, she stole pretty much every scene uh, <laughs> that she was on, and she was on most of the time. So, uh, and, and that was with Peter Tate and myself up in Edinburgh. So, as well as being an actor on the stage and on screen, Yvonne is also a playwright and a screenwriter. God, I loved that movie. Every Sunday, when I thought the campus was closed, I'd put the twins in the car and drive to the stadium. I'd sit in the stadium inside my car and sing to them. I'd sing to my babies. The twins were in a blanket on the seat next to me. I'd play with their fingers. That was before. How did your parents react to your decision? My mother was absolutely fine with it. As I said, she expected this to happen. They knew exactly the, the track that I would take. I would be in the arts. It was very, very straightforward. But my father had a very, very different reaction to it. Uh, <clears throat> You see, my sister, my older sister, is an artist, right. so she took the brunt <laughs> of his reaction when it comes to professions which, in his, uh, in his mind, pay nothing and are difficult and fraught with issues. And, and to be honest, he is, you know, to a greater sense, he is very, very correct. Uh, he was very concerned that we would be perpetually poor. <laughs> <laughs> would be perpetually fraught with insecurities because it's a profession that you need so much acclamation and adoration and he said you you don't want to be that person are you sure you want to be that person and so in that sense we had a very very honest conversation very very early on when I was about 13 <laughs> when I went to Sylvia Young on a Saturday school and so um, I didn't get a lot of hostility, but I got a lot of farm home truths about being in any profession, let alone being an actress or an actor, as you may say. It. My parents were very clever. Right. They they refused to pay for anything that was drama based, and they said, if you really want to take this on as a career, you've been ha you have your pocket money. You shall play for your drama classes. And I paid for most of my drama classes. At Sylvia Young. At Sylvia Young on a Saturday. Okay. And then I I decided to go to Guildhall for a Saturday class because I thought I'd slightly outgrown Sylvia Young and it was slightly more musical theatre based and I wanted to really tackle text and really mask myself in that world. So I paid for my Saturday class at Guildhall. And then off the back of that I decided to go to university and at that time, you know, you take your student loan and I was very lucky I had wonderful bursary that I applied for and managed to go to Tavada. It was one of the most intense experiences I've ever had. It's extremely intense. I was one of the younger students. I was 18 when I got into Tavada 
and for an 18 year old who's just discovering themselves, who's understanding what they're about, who's suddenly thrust into an environment where all you're doing is finding out more of the things that you do that are slightly weird or not helpful or conducive to your profession, it's difficult. It was a very difficult time. Well, I find that very interesting that now you were the youngest, but then what was the I, next stage? I up? actually, to be honest, by the time there were quite a few students who were young in right. the year. Right. I wasn't the youngest in the year. I was a, a group of, there was a group of young students right. in this particular year. Um, and I think they decided to embrace that and go where that particular field. So students who are slightly older and slightly more experienced and slightly more exposed to the world as people and also within the craft so they did lots of TIE or theatre productions before they went into drama school or even did a degree before they went to drama school were far more equipped <laughs> than us young ones. Um, they had a better understanding of text. For me a lot of the new texts were very new. I, I had no idea what some of them were um, and then suddenly you're thrust into being being in an environment where you have to perform at a very high level. Right. It was the fundamental base of everything I know as an actor. Let's put talent aside. To be able to work in the industry and to handle the workload of being a working actor in TV today, you need a strong skill base. You need a set of tools that you can call upon at any moment to work in this industry and have the longevity. And drama school completely cements that in every single way. With regards to, to coaching and courses, I absolutely agree that it's best for some people to take on courses. But I think fundamentally for most, they should consider drama school because it cements everything and it's in a condensed three years where you get a good foundation. You end up finding out a lot about yourself and you end up owning your performances, which is crucial in the working world. I think relying on a coach in the long run uh, makes you slightly unaware of what you're doing. You become slightly removed from your performance and you rely on someone to sort of vet you and to say, yes, you did well, yes, you didn't do, or no, that's not, no. And you need to start at some point becoming an actor and being very aware of what you project. But so once you graduate, what would your advice be? I mean, what happened there then? For you, once you graduated, was it theatre for you, or did you go into it was film work? And suddenly, uh, the best thing about a drama school as well is you end up navigating the agents, <laughs> the agents that you will need to speak to, in a slightly more controlled environment, in a nurturing environment, and you can have wonderful candid discussions with your with your tutors at drama school, and also they come into the drama school to watch you, and then they leave, and you can just actually think about what's best for you and also most of us had an agent before we left right. which is something that is so difficult to acquire in any circumstance if you're doing a course here and there the likelihood is you won't necessarily get all the agents coming to one one building to watch every single actor and also in productions that are catered towards making you look your best so would you agree that theatre is a great way to cut your teeth? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, the one thing that it does that I feel I prize above everything else is it grounds you. It makes you very aware of your being. Miss Gordon? Damn, I didn't recognize you at all. Guess I ain't seen you since, like freshman year. You were a student of mine? You don't remember me, a bastoon Leticia? Only messing with you. I was there till I got knocked up with somebody whose name we won't mention. Oh, I remember. I didn't know that you lived over here. So I never lived nowhere else. You did something different with your hair, right? Oh. Girl. 
<laughs> well, J Lo teaching English. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Social media has taken over everything. <laughs> in 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 many wonderful ways and in some not so wonderful ways. Um, today, you don't need to be in a theater to be performing. Today, you don't need to be in a TV production. Today, you don't need to be in a, in a film to be seen. You could have a YouTube channel. You could have a very present and active Vine that suddenly makes you very popular and suddenly executives will be hounding you to do your own comedy sketch on some network. Today, understanding how to utilize social media is crucial. That is a concern for me, that celebrity and fame is becoming more of a draw for youngsters to get into our industry rather than the pure passion and joy for words yes. and for performance. I, it's frightening. Yes, you're very, you're very right with your concerns about social media. However, I feel that regardless of whether one becomes an overnight sensation through social media, that isn't necessarily going to prove um, to be your credit when it comes to longevity within the career. Uh, it's a very long career and I wish that that's the one piece of advice that I, I now... <laughs> yes, please, I'd love to convey a piece of advice that you it's, wish you'd known before you'd entered. It's a long career. It's a very long career. You could peak, you could be the star at the age of 21 and then suddenly you're completely <laughs> irrelevant by the time you're 25. Or suddenly you could be chugging along, doing odd bits here and there in theatre and TV and then suddenly you're a star at 58. It's, it's such an odd career. There is no clear path that one has to follow. It's so specific to who you are and your skill set and how you look and it's a long career and it's all okay. That's the thing. I think I wish I was told uh, this much much earlier that it's okay when you're not working. It's actually okay when you are too. It's okay when you are or when you're not. And the other thing I want to ask you is being here in America as opposed to being in the UK. As an actor in the UK, I felt the grass is greener over in the US. Look how many star names they are that are British and they all seem to be the leads <laughs> in TV shows and films. They are taking over Hollywood. How wonderful this is. I could be one of them. Right. And rightfully so, yes, you could. But what I didn't think about was the fact that most of those actors were A-list actors anyway. They were already cast from the UK and were shipped over to do a production here and didn't have to come into the mainstream huddle, <laughs> as a good friend of mine called it, where you're there as number 159 on a slate that a casting director submits to, to a producer who doesn't even watch the full slate, probably gets bored halfway through and most times they, they sort of send it back to the, to the casting director and say pick your top 10 and most likely you're not part of the top 10 because one, your social media isn't as... as That's the as, shop, you've not got enough Twitter followers. <laughs> you don't have Absolutely. enough Twitter followers. How do they sell you, regardless of how wonderful you are, yeah. how do they sell you to this executive who, who knows you can find lots of wonderful, talented actors but you need that extra edge. Clearly, the market isn't as developed in the UK. There isn't as many roles that you're seen for in the UK. Yeah. So even though you're one of 15, that particular casting could come six months down the year when you haven't been seen for anything for months. And so it's, the grass is always greener. And I think it's best to have a very clear plan and to think of oneself as an actor of the world and to be malleable and to be realistic and to understand that it's a long career. Again, thank you so, so much. Lots of wonderful nuggets there. Uh, it's been which a pleasure. I hope you will find useful uh, as you push your way through to making it in this industry. My name is John Perkis. And we look forward to seeing you at the next episode of Diary of an Actor.